Welcome everyone. This is another Authors at Google talk. Today with us is Sir Lawrence Friedman. He's been a professor of war studies at King's College London since 1982 and vice principal since 2003. Elected a fellow of the British Academy in 1995 and awarded the CVE in 1996. He was appointed official historian of the Falklands campaign in 1997. He was awarded a, the KCMG in 2003. In June 2009, he was appointed to serve as a member of the official inquiry into Britain and the 2003 Iraq war. Professor Friedman has written extensively on nuclear strategy and the Cold War, as well as commentating regularly on contemporary security issues. His recent book, A Choice of Enemies, America Confronts the Middle East, won the 2009 Lionel Gelber Prize and Duke of Westminster Medal for Military Literature. Today, he will talk us through his newest book, Strategy and History. Please give a warm welcome to Sir Lawrence Friedman. Boris, thank you very much. Uh, it, it's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, uh, some, everybody here Googles regularly, so it's, uh, to actually be at the heart of it is, is quite exciting. Um, so um, what I want to do first is to explain to you uh, what the book is about and how it's organized. Uh, and, and then uh, give you some basic ideas about some of the main themes uh, before trying out on you uh, an approach to strategy which I think emerges from the book. Uh, I have to emphasize that, uh, because I'd like you to read it, that it doesn't depend on you agreeing with the approach to strategy, but I do think uh, uh, if you're going to write about these things, you should have some ideas at the end about it. The book is essentially a history of ideas. Uh, it, it's about, so it has quite a lot of, of, of different theories which I think impinge on strategy and make people, uh, make people think differently about it. And it's about the relationship between theory and practice, uh, about uh, how ideas about action are influenced by views about how the world works. So th that, that's sort of what inspired me to do it. It isn't um, really a, a how to do it book. It's not a book uh, that the, in, the inspiration of which was uh, you know, tw 20 lessons to success. Uh, if you just follow my example, you'll make a mint. Uh, you won't uh, if you try to follow what I say, but it, it gives you some ideas. So the way it's organized um, is a sort of first uh, looking at the prehistory of strategy in the sense that the word as we understand it came into use um, largely at the end of the 18th century, um, start of the 19th century. The, the word itself comes from the Greek strategos, the art of the general, and of course uh, a lot of the activity that we would now describe as being strategic was there before. And just because people didn't call it strategy doesn't mean to say that they weren't doing it. But the word itself, and therefore the interest in what it's about, uh, 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 and uh, how to define it, how to conceptualize it, um, comes into currency just before Napoleon. Uh, but I think Napoleon gives it more meaning to uh, those who are interested uh, in how uh, the, the art of warfare had been transformed since the French Revolution. But it was part of the Enlightenment because it captured the idea that with sufficient application of reason uh, and science, that the world could become much more comprehensible and predictable, and therefore controllable. Uh, and if there's an impulse behind strategy, it's a desire to make the future more in your control, more so in control than other people with whom you may be uh, in competition or in war. Uh, and the assumption is that if you understand that world better than they do and can work out your actions accordingly, you're the one who will come out on top. So it, re it reflected an enlightenment belief that it was possible to get a science of human affairs that would be following the science uh, of, of, of the, following the natural sciences. Napoleon gave it much more meaning because here was somebody who seemed to have uh, a, a genius uh, 
for, for battle, uh, for transforming the way that war was fought. Um, and two of those who fought in the Napoleonic Wars, not on the same side, uh, the Swiss Germany uh, uh, and the Prussian Clausewitz, uh, became the main interpreters of Napoleon through the 19th century and influenced the way that we think about not only war but also strategy ever since. And the basic point that they, were, that, that they sought to get over, and, and Clausewitz is much more nuanced and, and settled than Germany in this, but the underlying point was the same. Um, the, the efforts of the great general would be geared towards the decisive battle. And, and the decisiveness of battle was really important in this. Uh, it wasn't just winning. You would win in such a way that the opponent, the enemy, would be at your mercy. And so uh, the politics uh, of the conflict would be sorted out by the military victory, by the military success. So the idea of decisive battle, which is not a new idea, but was given much more credibility by, uh, by Napoleon's early successes, uh, was to the fore. If you won the battle, you would win the war. Now the problem uh, with this uh, became, was, could have been apparent at the time. There was uh, one campaign where both Germany and uh, Clausewitz were present, which was the 1812 uh, campaign against Russia on opposite sides. Uh, and uh, that showed a lot of the problems with the idea of decisive battle. Uh, Napoleon won at the Battle of Borodino, uh, but he didn't really, uh, didn't really win because the Russians had sufficient reserves left, as the Russians always do, uh, had sufficient reserves left to be able uh, to mount another attack. Napoleon went uh, for the capital city to find it abandoned and soon on fire and discovered he was stranded. He hadn't, didn't actually have a way of winning the war and famously then had to retreat. Uh, you could argue also that the uh, Peninsula War, uh, where the, f the first guerrillas uh, made their appearance, or first that were called that uh, in, in Spain, also demonstrated in the face of popular resistance, even if an army had been defeated, you could, su you could also struggle. So the problems with the idea of a decisive battle, in principle, were evident right from the start. Nonetheless, uh, to this day, uh, military strategy seems to be geared to that particular event. Yet, if you look at what the, uh, the developments in technology over the past uh, couple of hundred years, you realize just how much harder it is to get a decisive victory than it was uh, in Napoleon's day. Uh, the range of weapons, their lethality, their numbers, the ways in which you could bring reserves to the battlefield uh, through railways, the development of aircraft and, and so on. All of these made warfare much more uh, challenging and much more likely to end in attrition. Uh, a long battle, uh, 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 the, a long struggle that, that would not have uh, a, a, an easy answer, one side would eventually be basically worn down uh, by the other, in which case it would be just the superiority of resources that would make the difference. So I think, in, in the, I mean, we're happy to talk later about various ideas that, that have developed over the last couple of decade, uh, decades under the influence of the digital revolution about how military affairs might be affected by this. But essentially, if you're talking about wars between great powers, especially nuclear powers, uh, it's very hard to see how they can be concluded um, with the abject surrender of one to the other, especially if both have got nuclear weapons. Hence the phrase mutual assured destruction, which is very explicit about the state of affairs, uh, that warns of the consequences uh, of, of, of two sides trying to fight to the finish. And, it war uh, and the experience warns of the problems of believing that through clever strategy, you can control affairs because there's always something else to come behind. The next section looks at political affairs. 
and I start with the underdog, for reasons I'll explain in a minute. I start with revolutionary theory. Largely, re revolutionaries, because the gap between where they start and where they're going, we wish to end up, is enormous. Uh, they're the ones who think about strategy more than anybody else. It's often pretty hopeless and futile, but they do think a lot about it. Anybody who's had any connection with, with radical groups will know just how much strategizing goes on, often to little effect. But, but in the 1830s, when the first professional revolutionaries came along, they had an example not very long before of the French Revolution, which indicated how things could change, and a lot of unrest and unsettled um, uh, popular feeling uh, that gave them hope that things could be transformed. Uh, and it, a lot of the ideas that we now become very familiar with, of course, were very fresh in those times about, what, uh, about how society may develop uh, and the science um, of politics that Marx in particular, but others also thought that they had discerned that would uh, explain uh, why, in some way or other, their victory was inevitable. So, uh, uh, and they also were looking for a decisive event, just like the military strategists. Uh, in their case, the decisive event uh, was going to be the revolution, which would be the moment when you'd move from one political order to the next. And of course, uh, with, with the revolutionaries, uh, they didn't have much chance to put it into practice. When there were revolutions, for example, in 1917, they didn't occur in anything like the circumstances in which the revolutionaries had predicted. Their methods were different to those that they had said that they would follow. And then, of course, they were faced with the many challenges of coping with the society that they'd inherited. But what I try to do in the book is look through at the ways in which the frustrations of the revolutionaries led to new thinking about political action. And in particular, um, the importance of the way that people think about their situation um, as being what you had to influence and manipulate. Uh, if, uh, why was it that the masses didn't understand how repressed and oppressed uh, and exploited they were? What were the sources of their false consciousness? And as those ideas developed, uh, they merged into much more general thinking about how people construct the world in their heads uh, and the challenges of influencing those constructions. So, in fact, as you move on, um, you see within uh, political affairs, m quite mainstream now, not particularly radical, the idea of the narrative taking hold that what's critical is your ability to frame events in such a way that people will accept your version of what's going on and act accordingly. So the narrative becomes increasingly important to strategy. And you can argue something similar is happening, indeed influenced by some of these ideas in political affairs, in military affairs as well. In counterinsurgency theory, the importance of hearts and minds uh, as opposed just to beating people up so-called kinetic methods, um, the importance of hearts and minds lies uh, in, in the recognition that the way people think about a conflict, not necessarily that they like you, but if they think you're going to win, and maybe that it's going to be better for you if they do, it may well, again, affect their readiness to give support to insurgents, uh, provide recruits to insurgents, um, uh, fund them, or, or, or whatever else they might do. And similarly also, in the business sphere, um, if you look at the literature now, um, business strategy uh, is the dominant field. There's more books written about business strategy, uh, or, uh, and all the bits of business strategy, human relations, procurement, marketing, whatever, uh, than there are about military strategy. Uh, it only really started, you only see books on, on business strategy coming into being in the early 60s. Um, it has a similar sort of origin, however. Uh, just like military strategy was initially a, uh, about the uh, affairs of the great powers, so it is business strategy was about the affairs of the great companies, the big American corporations, uh, whose actual ability to grow their business was limited by antitrust laws. Um, and they, by and large, were not doubting their market share. The question for them was profitability. Um, 
and how do they get the most efficiency out of their business. So a lot of the original work on business strategy was looking at the structure of organizations to make sure that they were at their most efficient. The word competition didn't particularly appear. It was only towards, uh, as the 60s wore on, um, that the idea of competitive strategy in business became more and more important. Um, and even then, initially, uh, it, a, a lot of it was, uh, for example, uh, the work of Michael Porter, who some of you may be aware of, uh, at Harvard, the first sort of serious, uh, well, one of the first serious academic business strategists, um, was essentially about maintaining your market position uh, and repelling uh, uh, insurgents uh, in the sense of, of putting up market barriers uh, rather than necessarily making better products. Um, over the ensuing period, there's a lot more interest in innovation, finding new markets, uh, showing how that you, you can be cleverer than everybody else. But there's been a problem uh, with business strategy in that it hasn't really, unlike military strategy, had a single compelling model. Um, that has shaped all discussion. There's uh, numerous different uh, strategies on offer. Indeed, I was fa uh, fascinated to discover a whole academic literature on fads and fashions, uh, which charted the rise and fall uh, of a variety of ideas, often initiated by Tom Peters, uh, that uh, uh, grabbed attention for a few years and then were supplanted by something else and raised interesting questions about why do chief executives follow these strategies when experience should warn them that they may have a, uh, a short shelf life uh, and not produce the promised rewards and there's sort of interesting answers in terms of um, uh, if, if everybody else is following it then you don't lose out by following it yourself indeed it's often following the latest fashions often was uh, associated with higher executive pay, if not better results. So um, th there's an interesting question about, uh, about the development of business strategy uh, I in that it's often s struggled to find its way. So uh, w with that very quick uh, background as to how uh, the different elements, uh, and I should say the, the book ends with more social science stuff about uh, rational choice and, the, and, the, uh, and attempts by social scientists to also provide a scientific approach to strategy and what I think is the interesting influence of cognitive psychology on these ideas. Uh, that's very briefly the, uh, an overview of a very long book. Let me uh, give you uh, now uh, my sense of the approach that I think comes out of this. Um, one, of the, um, one of the things I'm trying to argue, as you will have gathered, is the attempts to control the environment well into the future so that you're sure that where you start, that by following your strategy you will reach the desired end, is often disappointing um, and misleading. That strategy is not necessarily a plan. I challenge the idea of strategy as a plan. Now, there's a, a very famous quote by the great Prussian Field Marshal uh, von Moltke that no plan survives com uh, contact with the enemy. I open the book with my favourite quote, uh, which is from gets to the same point in a more pithy way by the boxer Mike Tyson, which is everybody's got a plan until they get punched in the face. <laughs> um, and and, and uh, the, the, the reason why plans uh, aren't followed is, be, is for a very simple reason. It's a, it's a difference in a way between an engineering problem and a strategic problem. If you're dealing with physical properties that are well known, um, you may have to struggle, there may be uncertainty, but you should be able to get uh, eventually through experimentation uh, and, and clever thought to an outcome. Uh, with a strategic problem, you've got somebody trying to frustrate you. Uh, the example I use is um, the, the President Reagan's strategic defense initiative in the um, 1980s, where he said, um, understandably, wouldn't, isn't it better to uh, protect against a missile attack than to avenge a missile attack? And we should be able to protect against a missile attack, uh, 
because look how good we are, we put a man on the moon. But of course the moon wasn't trying to fight back. The moon wasn't trying to repel borders. Um, and that's the basic difference. You're dealing with an intelligent opponent. Now, if you're very strong, then you should be able to get your way in many situations. There's a quote from Ecclesiastes um, that the race doesn't always go to the most swift uh, or, or the fight to the most strong, but Damon Runyon added, they're the ones to bet on. Uh, by and large, the fast win uh, 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 and the strong win. Um, so the interesting things about strategy, which is why I looked so much at revolutionary strategy, is under what circumstances can the underdogs do well? Now, one answer to that comes from um, uh, being cleverer than the sort of muscle-bound opponent that you, you may face. Uh, and the example um, that's often used for that is, is David and Goliath. Uh, it's, uh, every, it's every time somebody sees themselves uh, as the underdog, the, the weak guy in the, in the fight, they will cite David and Goliath to give them hope uh, and, to, and to show that they're also on the side of right. You know the story of David and Goliath with the, um, uh, the, the Philistines offering their champion to challenge, um, uh, to challenge the Israelites who don't come up with a champion. And that's actually one important part of the story because it should have been King Saul. That was his job. That was why he'd been made king. But he was very cautious and a, and a bit reluctant. So bizarrely accepted the claims of a shepherd boy uh, to go on instead. Um, and this was a shepherd boy who refused to accept uh, Saul's armor. Uh, so he went undefended against this giant. Uh, instead, he picked up some stones from the stream, used his sling, and, uh, and sent them in the direction of, the, um, uh, 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 of Goliath, hit him between the head. Goliath falls down, he chops off his head uh, with Goliath's own sword. Um, and, that's, uh, and the Philistines uh, agree. Now, the interesting thing about all of this is uh, it could have been different. And the, and the ways it could have been different gives you a warning about the under, an underdog strategy uh, that, takes in, that, that tries to work through deception uh, and getting in the first blow. First, you know, this could have been a couple of centimeters, this could have been very different. If the thing had pinged off the top of, of Goliath's helmet, he wouldn't have had a second chance. He had one chance and one chance alone. Um, secondly, um, that it, it required the Philistines to accept this result. Uh, if they thought this was really unfair, this was asymmetric warfare after all, if they thought this was unfair, uh, they could have rushed forward and the Israelites would still have been in trouble. And third, and most, and most relevant, um, is that you can't, you can't do this over and over again. The next time uh, a champion of the Philistines came uh, uh, along, he would at least have a better helmet, uh, and he'd certainly be looking quite carefully at what David was up to. And it's the problem of the trickster through the ages. If you look at uh, Odysseus, who I spent some time on in the early stages of the book, uh, who was the great trickster and a really successful one, and Homer really approves of doing things by guile rather than force, but he's not believed. After a point, uh, nobody trusts him at all. Even when he's telling the truth, he's not believed. Uh, so there are limits um, on, on what uh, you can do by cunning and deception. Not to say it can't be successful. In particular circumstances, it may be very successful. But there are limits. Uh, and you can see that in military terms, for example, with the Schlieffen plan. Um, uh, we, you'll be hearing more about it in, as we go through the anniversary of the start of the First World War next year. But it's the German plan. Uh, to take France quickly out of war um, with a knockout blow. And once they failed in the knockout blow, they were stuck with a war of attrition. Now, the great book for those who want to be cleverer than their opponent is the Chinese uh, uh, sage Sun Tzu, um, which is a very good read, very interesting. Um, it wasn't very specific, which is why it stood the test of time, lots of aphorisms. And the basic idea is, what, is to be a better intelligence than the opponent, 
and, and to deceive them. What a, if the enemy thinks you're strong, you show you're weak. If the enemy thinks you're weak, you show you're strong. If the enemy thinks uh, uh, you're retreating, you advance. If the enemy thinks you're advancing, you get the idea. Um, uh, and you can always make up some of these aphorisms. There's more to it than that, but uh, the basic idea and the reason why it's so appealing to people uh, is that it, it pays, plays in some ways to vanity, that if you can be cleverer than others, and who doesn't want to think that they're cleverer than others, uh, that, that, that you can win. But the problem comes, obviously, when you face an opponent who's got more resources and is as clever or indeed cleverer than you. Uh, and if, every, you know, if everybody's read Sun Tzu, it's not altogether clear how you'll ever engage because everybody's going to be deceiving each other so much uh, that they end up with total disorientation. Uh, uh, but Sun Tzu, um, because it warns of the dangers of direct attack, it encourages indirect approaches, uh, has been taken um, uh, as, uh, uh, as the Bible of those uh, who want to um, want to try to achieve um, great results uh, without too much pain. Uh, so it's beloved in the business community. Uh, the fam fav my favorite moment with Sun Tzu is in the episode of The Sopranos where Dr. Malfi uh, is saying to Tony Soprano, listen, if you want to, uh, don't come to me. To, uh, if, if you want to be a better strategist, go read The Art of War. Uh, and then a few weeks later he comes back, I, I read The Art of War and it's better than Machiavelli. Uh, and immediately Amazon sales of Sun Tzu shot up in New Jersey. Uh, <laughs> so, um, uh, so it's an attractive book, but I think there are limits on what it can offer. Um, uh, which is heresy, I should say, to a lot of people in the strategy business. Um, so what's a different approach? Well, for a different approach is, is where I start the book. Um, which is with primates, um, with chimps. Um, we've talked about Antwerp before. Uh, at Antwerp Zoo, there was a chap called Franz de Vaux uh, in the 1970s who stood day after day watching chimpanzee communities. And he wrote a book about it called Chimpanzee Politics. Um, and what he realized, that when the alpha male, the big, strong leader of the pack, was being challenged, it wasn't by somebody who was bigger and stronger, um, but actually the challenges were often quite clever. They did use deception, but they also formed coalitions. They found partners. Um, and that's a pretty good way to challenge, your, uh, challenge a stronger opponent. Find somebody and get stronger than they are. Um, and that's what the chimps did. Um, and the other thing that the studies of chimps showed is that though they did go to war, um, and usually uh, for, for, for animals, they, they were prepared to kill their own species as a deliberate act. It wasn't out of emotion or anger. Um, it was quite deliberate. And we know it's deliberate because um, they would tend to try to, again, have uh, superiority in numbers if they mounted an attack. And if they didn't have a superiority, they slunk away. Um, and I think that also points to an important lesson, which is the importance um, of endurance. Actually, rather than go for a swift knockout blow, if you're weaker, often the first thing to do is to survive and endure until you find the point at which you can gain strength from partnerships or because something else has happened which allows you to move in. So that the, um, the lessons, that, and I argue that these are elemental and can be taken uh, all the way through are uh, the importance of endurance, the importance of coalitions, and actually to make coalitions work, and to, if you are going to deceive an opponent, the importance of empathy. And you don't necessarily think of chimps as being especially empathetic, but what that meant was that they had what biologists called a theory of the mind, so that they understood that the way another individual behaved depended upon the way uh, that they thought. And so you get back to this, in a sense, again, not, not a thing again you'd associate with a chimp, a narrative, but you get back to the idea that the way that the world is constructed is very important to understand behavior. And if you can change that, you, c you can change behavior. And just to give an, a, an example of um, leaping forward, 
uh, so it says from Chimps to Churchill. Uh, when Winston Churchill became Prime Minister in 1940, in May 1940, um, the issue that uh, he faced at the time was not how Britain could beat Germany in war, because all Britain's allies had allies, they were all being swept away by the Nazi advance, by the Blitzkrieg. Um, and the issue was Britain finding itself alone. And the question was, should they attempt a negotiated peace with, uh, with Hitler? And he concluded, no, um, uh, and persuaded his colleagues. It was quite a, a serious debate in cabinet uh, that that should not, they should not, not because he ruled it out in the future, but he didn't need to at the time. They could endure and survive for the moment. Um, and then they would have to review. So in the first instance, and this is true of much strategy, because a lot of strategy is written as if you're on the offensive from word go, uh, and it's about winning and beating and so on. Actually, a lot of strategy is about survival. It's about circumstances I I in which you're under challenge, uh, and you're trying to work out, uh, often perhaps from a very good position, how you're moving into a weak position. So that was Churchill's starting point. But Churchill did have a view about how victory might come eventually. And it was quite different from the view of his predecessor, Neville Chamberlain. Um, uh, uh, and that was that the key was the United States. He immediately set up a correspondent with President Roosevelt with a view all the time to persuading the United States to provide Britain, the British Empire, with help. Um, uh, and eventually, hopefully, coming into the war. So when, on the 7th of December 1941, the Americans were in the war, helped the next day by uh, Hitler's uh, declaration of, own declaration of war on the United States, w one of many strange moves, in retrospect, made by, by Hitler. The Japanese didn't reciprocate. Uh, um, the Japanese didn't... De uh, declared war on the United States, but they didn't declare war on Russia, for example. Um, but anyway, Hitler, Hitler declared war on the United States. And Churchill's comment, um, recollection was, so we had won at last. Um, we would survive. Um, now, th you know, there were years to go before the war was over, but he now knew the balance had shifted. And of course, even before that, indicated Russia had, uh, Soviet Union had come into the war. Um, and when that happened, uh, uh, Churchill was chided for forming an alliance with Stalin, because Churchill had been a great anti Bolshevik, a, 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 an opponent of the Soviet Union. And his comment was if Hitler invaded Hades, uh, I'd say a good word for Satan in the House of Commons. Um, so he understood from the start the importance uh, of coalition. So what, what then, um, uh, uh, just to sort of bring, pull this together, uh, am, I, am I arguing? I've argued coalition. I've argued often um, the starting point is defensive rather than offensive. Um, and that leads, I think, to a challenge to the idea, which is very strong in, in the literature, that strategy is about setting your objectives and working out how to achieve them. It's always about the relationship between ends and means, but somehow the ends define what you're trying to do. And I think it's, it's an understandable, and sometimes uh, it's fine, because you can set objectives and you can see a way forward with a plan to achieve them. But there, there are two reasons for caution in that. First, uh, actually, uh, in practice, strategies are set by the problems you face in the here and now. Strategy is not about getting to an ultimate objective. Strategy is about getting to a better place than you would be without strategy. Uh, and that may be uh, quite short term. It may be a bit longer term. But the initial objectives are unlikely to be ultimate objectives. They're going to be uh, what you can do to get yourself to, to address the problems you face at the moment. That is what most strategy in practice is about, never mind what the strategy books may say. The second reason why it's important not to get fixated on the ultimate objective is actually in life there isn't. You, you, you rarely reach an ultimate objective. 
And it goes back to the problem of the decisive battle or the decisive revolution. Um, they're not they're decisive only to a point. You win, um, you win a battle, the enemy surrenders, but then you've got a whole series of other problems to face uh, about working the peace. You win, a, you win an election, you find yourself in government. You have a successful takeover, uh, you've now got to work out how to merge uh, one company into another. You have a revolution, um, the regime is overthrown, uh, but somehow you've got to govern. So strategy doesn't stop. It's not a three-act play. Uh, it's a soap opera. Uh, you get to one stage, and then there's another stage, and a stage after that. It, it, it's permanent. Uh, it's, it's part of human activity. So um, the approach that I'm sort of arguing for at the end is based on, uh, on getting away from the idea of a plan with a, def a definite end and thinking more about strategy as a response to a changing environment, which is throwing up new problems, which requires you to think through um, what you can do to get yourself into a better position, at which point you'll be thinking again about how to get to an even better position. As you move, new possibilities open up, uh, and uh, other possibilities may be closed down. So it's very rarely the case when you embark on a great um, uh, campaign that you'll end up in the place where you hope to be or even expected to be. Things happen. There are questions of chance, of serendipity, uh, that, that, that will make a difference. So to conclude, the... Um, what I hope people will, will get from this book is um, first a, a sense of the many, many different ways that people have thought about strategy and talked about strategy. Um, I hope they'll get a sense of the, uh, of the importance of political theory, uh, 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 the big ideas of the time uh, in shaping how people act uh, uh, and address their affairs. And I hope that it'll also uh, make people a little bit cautious uh, about the claims of strategists. Uh, as Eisenhower has said about plans, plans are useless, but planning is essential. I think strategy is essential. I think it is important to think clearly uh, and, conscious, uh, and consciously and deliberately about what you're trying to do. But it should always be done with this awareness that you can't control your, your future environment. There are other players uh, involved. Uh, and Things will happen that nobody's expected that will change what you want to achieve. So on that, I'd be more than happy to take questions, but I'll stop there. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you for the talk. I was wondering, um, in your, when you were talking about the, the, the theory of decisive battle and, and von Clausewitz, I haven't read von Clausewitz, so, um, but it seems like I wonder how much that, I, I'd be curious to know how much this is based on, on their actual interpretation of history and did that actually happen in the centuries beforehand or is it more something you get from at least today what we see in, in fiction and literature, this idea of champion versus champion and one side just surrendering. Like I don't know how much that actually happened in history and was that actually a, a, a valid strategy for some period of time? Well it's, it's an interesting question because um, actually in the 18th century um, there were much more uh, battle it wasn 't so decisive. Um, it was very much a response to Napoleon uh, uh, and what Napoleon achieved. so it was based on experience, but actually quite a limited one and Clausewitz famously, um, uh, as he was writing his great work on war, uh, had a rethink because he looked back and realized there were alternative ways in which conflicts could be resolved other than by the decisive battle. Uh, although all his instincts, uh, and, 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 the, uh, and he never finished rewriting his book, so we don't quite know how it would have ended up, pushed him towards decisive battle. Jomini uh, never really veered away from that. He disliked uh, guerrilla warfare. He thought this was uh, uh, sort of beneath contempt, um, though he knew it, knew it happened. And interestingly, Jomini 
was actually a far greater influence on American early military thought uh, than was Clausewitz, though he's, he's less remembered now. Uh, so it was based on a very limited experience, uh, uh, but very powerful experience that these men had been through. Is there actually a lot of cases throughout history where you do see wars being fought where it's, it, it ends up being champion versus champion or king versus king or something and it steps down? Because I almost have the suspicion that that doesn't actually happen in practice and instead you see the 16 years war or the 100 years war or battle after battle after battle. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's obviously part of my point is that, is that if you don't have a decisive victory, then these things go on. But of course there have been. I mean, you can think of the, of the Six Day War uh, in 1967, the, the, the Israelis got in the first blow. Um, they took on a, an apparently powerful coalition, and they won. Now, you can then say they won, but they're still struggling and fighting uh, in, the, in the territories they occupied then, or some of the territories they occupied then. So how decisive in the long term it was is a question, but certainly in the short term, it was seen to be the state of Bangladesh exists because India went to war against Pakistan. Um, and, and defeated them. So it, it, it does happen. Uh, it, by and large, if, if the war is quick, then the result tends to be more decisive, uh, that the opponent has been caught off guard. But the memory lingers. So uh, 1870, the Franco-Prussian War, which leads to the, the, the unification of Germany, uh, Alsace and Lorraine taken from, from the French, the resentments were still there. Uh, 1918, there's a defeat of Germany, but the resentment is still there. Uh, uh, so th that's why, you know, one of the points I'm trying to make uh, in terms of things are never quite as decisive as they seem, but they have moved you to a different stage. It seems you're making, uh, you're suggesting that the traditional military distinction between strategy and tactics should be um, obliterated, much more of a fusion of those two concepts. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, the, the, there's a very strong uh, and understandable um, hierarchy in thinking, which to some extent reflects command structures. Uh, you know, you've got uh, uh, the, the political masters, the, the general staff, and the, the senior commander, the field commander, um, the, the uh, local general, the, you know, and, and tactics is right at the bottom of all of that. Um, but it does, the principles, it seems to me, are often the same. Um, obviously, the scale can vary. So in recent times, people have been writing about, say, the strategic corporal. Uh, because, say, you're a young platoon commander and you're, and you're in the middle uh, of a, a not very friendly city and facing a big demonstration, the choices that you make can have big consequences. And you don't have a chance to feed up the, the chain of command. You, you, you've got seconds sometimes in which to make a decision. So obviously there's, there's questions of scale and, and consequences that vary, but the principles are the same. Um, and also, uh, I mean, it's a complex argument to get it now, but one of the uh, pushes in a lot of thinking about military strategy uh, has been what they call to develop the operational level, um, somewhere between tactics and, and military strategy. Um, which is actually a politics-free zone, as, it, as it's described. And you can see why a general might like a politics-free zone, but it's not actually healthy, uh, and actually it's, it's not actually correct, because most military force, uh, when it's applied, has political implications in every way, um, in every way it goes forward. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I, part of the, it, it, there's actually quite a chunk of the book which is challenging, not so much the distinction between strategy and tactics, but, but the way in which these very uh, definite hierarchies of strategy have developed. Do you have any thoughts around what's going on in Washington right now with the brinksmanship around the government shutdown and the fiscal cliff? Um, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts about the strategies that are being used and what strategies should be used. <laughs> um, Russia, as, as a foreigner, I should interfere in your internal affairs. Um, <laughs> I mean, it, it was weird because I, I arrived in Washington on, uh, on Tuesday and my, and my first meeting was cancelled and the guy who was supposed to chair my second was furloughed. Uh, so, uh, but we did have furlough fries for lunch, which was quite... Uh, um, and it's a really, I mean, it's, a, it's, it's actually a fascinating case because um, 
it appears it's simply a sort of Congress versus uh, the executive branch or, or the Repub Republicans versus Democrat. But actually, the key question is why does a group of Republican congressmen feel able to withstand a tremendous amount of pressure that in other circumstances would be assumed to be uh, al almost irresistible because it threatens the ability of your um, party to win elections in the future. Nobody, no opinion poll is suggesting that the actions of the House Republicans at the moment are anything other than unpopular or that um, the Republicans, uh, many of the House Republicans uh, are, are, are unhappy with this, but this is sufficient uh, to tie the hand of Speaker Boner. So, you know, one question is why doesn't he face them down? And that presumably something to do with his own position. But why these guys uh, feel that they don't have to worry about this pressure because their own positions are absolutely safe because of redistricting, because uh, of the fact that they can get funds from uh, wealthy supporters and they don't have to go through the, the party to get the funds. They feel absolutely safe. And so they can pursue this uh, crusade, if you like, um, without personally having to feel, face the consequences. Uh, I mean, and, and they'd have to be broken when, when uh, uh, maybe they, they also think that because of the pressure of default or, or, or something, that pre the president will be the one who has to blink first. Maybe that's also part of it. I don't see how he can. Um, so my guess is that at some point, there will be sufficient pressure from other Republicans on Speaker Boner that, that he has to um, find some way out of it. It's not immediately obvious at the moment. Um, and uh, I think it's an absolutely classic strategic problem because it's not just a question of the tactics that are being adopted. It's the way the whole issue is structured and also the way it's framed. So that you know, uh, the Speaker wants it to appear as a, as a problem of a lack of compromise, uh, the president wants it to appear as a problem of extortion uh, and bullying. So it, 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 it has very big consequences. So in the trouble with academic students of strategy, we can find all sorts of grim events absolutely riveting um, uh, without thinking always of the consequences. I think it's, it's very serious um, uh, because it you know, goes to the heart of the governability and the reputation of the United States. But, but as a strategic problem, it reveals quite a lot of important issues. So your whole talk really focused on the evolution of strategy and then defining really what is the success and what's the end goal. And I feel that heavily in the path is this aspect of probability and luck to actually get there. And over the years, luck has become probability, which now we have predictive analytics. And I was wondering with all the computing power and predictive analytics these days, how much you felt strategy was going to change in the next five years and what direction you thought it would go? That's really interesting. Um, Clearly, the, I mean, you can trace this back, and I do trace it back, to the, the 1950s, and particularly the Rand Corporation, um, which, were the first, which were the first to see um, the possibilities of making calculations using computers, which they had, um, that the human mind couldn't make. Um, and um, in a sense, simulating uh, states of affairs that would, in other ways, be beyond human imagination. So um, that be, the, since then, there's been a continuing belief that it is actually possible to crank in the variables, um, to almost have a experiment, have a little experiments in the way an engineer would, and, and work out how things are likely to, to work out. And I think in certain if you're trying to understand uh, human behavior in the mass, we do a lot, a lot of, sort of basic supply and demand stuff, this will stand you in good stead. If you're talking about relatively stable societies with re relatively stable behavior patterns, this can, can be quite interesting. Um, but I wouldn't want to be the one who relies upon it uh, if it was a really big decision. If it's an outlying decision, if it's an, you know, if you're talking about situations with where the sample size is small and the variables are many um, and the possibilities are, of chance and luck uh, are considerable, then as likely as not your predictions will let you down. 
And you've always got the possibility that somebody else is doing the same calculations on the other side and working out, um, uh, uh, make, making the same, coming to the same conclusions about might, what might happen and acting accordingly. Uh, and when there, has, when there has been a degree of experimentation, I mean, like all of these experiments, they're, they're largely done on graduate students in this part of the world. Uh, 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 so whether this is representative behavior, one can ask. But they show actually that people aren't necessarily naturally strategic, but they understand when they're in these situations, they understand they need to vary their behavior if they're too predictable. You know, the, 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 in a sort of repeated game, they'll get caught out. So um, I think there are possibilities to understand um, large areas of human uh, affairs, which are often in many ways not political. Uh, the, the, just the way that people operate and re relate to their environment. But the more political it becomes, and the more conscious people are of that they're in a conflict, I think the less likely it is that you will, that, that will, in the end, take you as far as, as, you, as people might hope. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the role of uh, process innovations, particularly things like uh, the Roman camp formation and uh, John Boy's description of the OODA loop and the uh, tactical operations center and uh, how they contribute to changes in strategy. Uh, oh, and also impact as uh, force multipliers. Yeah. Um, I, I spent a bit of time on John Boyd um, more than the other things you mentioned because Boyd was an innovative thinker and how uh, the don't know him, he was a um, a fighter pilot uh, who uh, wrote the manuals on, on dogfights, and out of this, this idea of the OODA loop, which is observation, orientation, decision, adaptation, I think that's right, um, developed, which was a way of getting to the idea that what was important was thinking faster, uh, more accurately than your opponent, rather than necessarily having more firepower. Um, and, and it was a very influential idea. It was not a bad idea. I mean, it, it had a lot of effect. I think some of other of, of Boyd's ideas were, were, were less successful. Um, the problem, uh, there's no, I don't think there's any basic problem with the idea of the OODA loop. It's like one of these things, the, like, like, uh, uh, like SWOT, SWOT analysis or um, uh, it just, they're useful tools when, once you start thinking about it. What, what I thought you were going to ask about um, when you start talking about process is, is, thing, is things where people have tried uh, to change, but strategies have been based on essentially changing the ways you go about your business, uh, which a lot of business strategies like that. And the one I spend a bit of time on in the book is, is business process re-engineering. Um, which was a fascinating example of um, a, um, a fad, one of the, uh, and a very influential one. Al Gore once you know, talked about applying it to the United States government, which may not have been a bad idea, I guess. Um, and was based on the idea that you, you can um, take a particular process uh, or, or, or a company or of any organization break it down into its component parts, an analyze each individually, relate them to each other, and then put them together again into some more efficient form. And it was really, uh, it sort of swept the board in, in the mid-1990s um, because it, it was seemed to be a way of taking advantage of the digital revolution, which is part of what Boyd's OODA loop did. Um, um, and sh uh, uh, and you know, gave, gave you the possibility of being much more efficient, creating more shareholder value, and so on. The problem was it soon became associated with redundancy because in order to demonstrate uh, the, the, where the change had happened, as often as not those who'd been through the process said, uh, and we've lost these, pe you know, these people who've uh, been let go, whatever the euphemism is. Um, and the consequence of that is that as soon as a, a firm started talking about business process re-engineering, the workforce got a little anxious. Um, and resistance set in. And then, like so many of these fads, which had been overhyped, once people started looking at the claimed successes, they found other reasons, or the successes didn't last, and so on and so forth. Uh, uh, and what, you know, had some quite good ideas in it uh, got lost. And also, one of the 
the problems with it was was the way the narrative around it so it, when you had uh, the proponents of this saying you know management has joined the dangerous pr professions uh, uh, help the wounded but shoot the stragglers uh, and so on uh, the sort of macho language with which it was spoken about was also part of the resistance so I think it's, it, a lot of this is, is um, a warning against hype there are I mean any organization needs to look at its process and so and some strategies need a change in process some processes lead to a change in strategy but it's all these things it's sort of the, the belief that you've got the the winning formula that will be the key to everything that's often the cause of trouble thank you everyone uh, please join me in thanking sir Lawrence Friedman thank you.